ندعو نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء ما يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعصهما فلا يذر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا وقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الوقت من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ألهمني رشدي وعذني من شر نفسي Today I want to talk about Surah Al-Kahf <coughs> and I want to present to you the main theme what is the message of Surah Al-Kahf About this surah the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said Whoever reads Surah Al-Kahf every Jum'ah he will be protected from the fitna of the jahl In another narration the Prophet said whoever memorizes the first 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kahf he will be protected from the jahl. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever memorizes the last ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahf will be protected from the jahl. So you can say Surah Al-Kahf has something about it that protects us from this thing that we call the jahl. What does the word the jahl mean? This also I want to clarify for you. Dajjal. Dajjal means, you know how you have something that's gold-plated, but it's not the real gold. In, in, the, just the outer plate is gold, but inside there's no gold. It looks like glitter on the outside, but it does, has nothing, in the, nothing of that glitter inside. It has no intrinsic uh, uh, glitter. Dajjal also means to lie, to deceive. So, this surah helps us identify <coughs> elements that have to do with deception. And this, the main theme of this whole surah, as we will discuss, the main theme of this whole surah is do not be deceived by material means. Do not be, what we call materialism, don't be deceived by materialism. Don't be deceived by what Confucius called the material sheets around you. What Iqbal calls the glitter of the world. So, the stories in Surah Al-Kahf, they all have to do with the different aspects of, different aspects of deception of materialism. Sometimes it comes in the form of Wealth, sometimes it comes in the form of knowledge, in different forms we will discuss. So I want to go over some of the verses of Surah Al-Kahf and the different stories, tying them and the different verses together. The first part of Surah Al-Kahf which discusses, Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. All gratitude is for Allah. Who has made, who has put no ambiguity in this book? There's nothing ambiguous, it's straightforward. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديد. To warn you of a great war. بأسا شديد has been translated in many different ways, but the real meaning in this ayah and its connection with Dijal is that there will be a great war. Malhamatul Uzma, Malhamatul Kubra, which the Prophet has in the books of Hadith, it is called Kitabul Malahim. You know Malhama? Butchering, butchering, just butcher. And what will be the things that will lead to this final war? You can say World War III. But I'm not going to discuss this right now. I'm going to discuss because that has to do with materialism also. But from here, I want to discuss. 
Then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning this whole war and who will be the actors in this war, <laughs> but then after that, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاقِيُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِن لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ يَا سَبَبْ إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَىٰ الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا This is Dajjal. Whatever we have put on this earth is Zina. It's beauty. It's the glitter just for a certain time. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَىٰ الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلَىٰ On the one side is the glitter and the beauty of the world. And on the other side is doing justice and good deeds and fair play. So these are two opposites. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَعَ الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا وَإِنَّ لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدًا جُرُوسًا And whatever is on this, then this will be utterly wasted. It's like a bathroom that looks good. But in the end of the day, it's just a bathroom. Then Allah gives the example of the Ashab al-Kahf, the seven sleepers. The main point here, again, look at these people, because I have to now summarize. Look at these people. How Allah protected them in a time of tyranny, in a time of fitna, in a time of deception, Allah protected them, number one. Number two, look at them, how Allah put them to sleep and then Allah brought them back to life. The, the world of materialism doesn't understand this. How can somebody sleep for 300 years and then be brought back to life and then go back to sleep? The world of materialism doesn't understand this because the world of materialism only looks with one eye. This is also the biggest... Uh, if I had time, I, would, I have so much to say. But this is also the biggest problem with science. Science has completely closed its eyes. One of its eyes to the idea that there is another life, the idea of God. Just it wants to see only with one eye, one perspective. And that's what the first part, which has to do with Christians and the Reformation and what that has led to. But then, Ashab al-Kahf, Allah says, I brought them back to life. Look, there is another life. There is more to reality than you can see. There's more to reality than your observation of the material world. And this material world, as beautiful as it is, it will end. And then, this is the same surah. Now notice, this is the same surah in which the Prophet is told to not to forget to say inshallah. Remember when he was asked the questions? I can't go into the details. Don't say I will do this tomorrow. Allah, except by the will of Allah. Why this surah has this verse in it? Why this surah? Because again, relying on Allah instead of the material means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ O Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ O Prophet of Allah, keep yourself patient. Who, with who? الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ الْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Those people who remember Allah in the day and the night wanting Allah's pleasure. وَلَا تَعْدُوا عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ don't turn your eyes to the people that want zinatul hayat al dunya. The people who want the glitter of this world, you keep yourself away from them. And don't follow the one whose heart we have turned away from our remembrance. And 
and then you know he just follows his own desires. He's chained in his own desires and his own habits. Here, the main theme again. The second story after this is the mention of Iblis and Shaytan. This again, just so I can quickly mention the point and how it relates to the overall theme of the surah. Iblis was correct. I'm better than you. He was correct from his logical perspective, from the material perspective, he was right. I'm better than you. Fire is better than dust. But what is it that Iblis didn't see was the ruh. When I blow my ruh into him, this human, that's the thing that made him great. Not this mud. It's the ruh. It's the ruh. When I blow the ruh into this man, then you bow down. That was the point of bowing down to Adam والسلام, was when Allah said, I breathe into him the ruh. That's what makes man superior. Not this material body. For the material body, Allah has always said, what are you made of? What are you made of? Just a, a water that's emitted? Something that's emitted, that's all you are. Whenever Allah has talked about the material aspect of man, Allah has always looked at it or mentioned it in somewhat of a negative way. But when it says, We've made man in the best of the stature. It's talking about his spiritual potential. And not his, his, his material makeup. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that says, after that is the story of the man who enters the garden. You all know the story. Again, the same theme. This man enters the garden. He has two gardens. There's trees around the garden. So if any wind comes, the garden is still protected. It has a self-irrigating system. It is all a great thing. I don't think these gardens will ever be destroyed. My investment, my hard work, it's not going to go anywhere. But what happens when the garden is destroyed? What does he say? Okay, by the way, that man that's with him, he says, He says, you see me less than you in wealth. And in children, you see less than me in resources. That's why you look down upon me. This is what happens with materialism. Materialist, when materialistic thoughts take over your mind, you start looking at those, you get obsessed with those that are above, with you, above you in the material sense. Start looking down at the people who are less than you. And then, Asa Rabbi yu'tini khayram min jannatik. Maybe Allah will give me better than your two gardens. And then what happens? Then the, uh, the, 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 the natural disaster comes, his garden is ruined. And then what does he say to this situation? Very interesting, his words. He says, He says, He says, He says, what a destruction for me. Lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. I wish I had not done shirk with Allah ever. The word for his garden. He believed in his garden so much it was like his God. His investment, his hard time. The word here is, he says, he says, he says, oh my name. He turns to Allah and says, I wish I never did shirk. I wish I had not relied only on these material things. Because these material things, they come in, they can go. They, they, give, they can be given and they can be taken away. So first was, the story, in terms of stories, the Ashab al first. Then the Prophet is told, say inshallah. Then the third one is, this. Before this is also the story of Adam and Iblis, which I explained. After this is the story. Okay, then after this, Allah says, Al-Malu wal-Banuna zinatul hayatul dunya. 
Again, the same word. Over there, in the beginning, in the first 10 verses. We've made whatever is in the earth, zina. Over there, after that, the verse that says, وَاسْبِنْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ فِي الْغَدَاثِ وَالْعَشِيدَ يُرِيدُنَا وَجْهَ يُرِيدُنَا وَجْهَ وَلَا تَعْدَ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Same word. Over here, الْمَالُ وَالْبُنُونَ زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Wealth and children and resources, these are just zina. These are the glitters of this life. زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتُ the good things that will remain with you and go with you and travel with you in this journey. Very long journey because gen this life is very short. Where we came from, because before this life we had a life. This is another thing. This is why in Islamic <coughs> theology we are taught and we believe that every human being has the innate nature, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In philosophy we call it a priori. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, it's very, philosophically speaking, it's very, it's like the peak of Qur'an in a sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all human beings, just like in the Day of Judgment, we will all be lined up in one saf. All human beings will be lined up in one row. In the, in, prior to coming to this world, Allah said to all human beings in their spiritual realm, in the ruh, in the form of the ruh, Allah says, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Am I not your Lord? Qalu bala. Yes, we said yes. So we knew and we understood innately that there is. This is why Islam called, this is why the Prophet said, Kullu yuladin ala fitra. Everyone is born on nature. Because by nature, Islam believes, Islam teaches that by nature, human being recognizes that there is a God. Innately, human beings do. This is why, think about it, why do even human beings question the question of God? Why from the beginning of history do we even question that there is something out there? Even if you don't believe in God, you want to believe that there are some aliens out there, some intelligent force out there that somehow manipulated life on this world. Anyway, al-malu wal banuna zinatul hayat dunya What will Dajjal do? Dajjal will bring you out of the spirituality into the world of materialism. See, one thing you have to keep in mind is that there has been a great shift in the last 300 years of how human beings think. And just think of this diagram for a second. If you have God, Allah, and you have the soul, meaning your ruh, and the hereafter, the life of salvation, the life to come, on the one side, and instead of God, you have the 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 material world, instead of the ruh, you have the human body, and instead of the here, uh, instead of the salvation in the hereafter, your ajila, the here and the now, a dunya, and here and the now is more specifically. What has happened to humanity? 300 years ago, whether you were a, whoever you were, you were more on this side than this side. You were more on the side of thinking about God. You may be a Hindu, a Parsi, a Buddhist, whatever, but you were still more concerned. It was more of a reality. Think of this, just so that you can maybe understand this a little bit deeper. Think of a time where there was no watch. <coughs> Again, time's going to run out, and I will try to make sure today I finish on time. But think of a time where there was no watch. What was the watch? You needed the sun and the moon and the, the seasons to be your watch, right? You needed the seasons to be your watch, meant that you were much more in tune with nature, you were much more in tune with seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who runs the time. But when man made the watch, you don't need nature no more. Even though the nature is just, the watch is just synchronizing itself to the outer world. But the point I'm trying to make is, our eyes have moved away from what we would normally be if we were connected with nature to, a, to, to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this mentions the story of Musa and Khidr. Again, a story where Musa is looking at things from the perspective of the lahir. He sees the appearance of things, not the realities of things. He sees the things that are obviously in front of him, 
but he cannot see beyond the appearances in this event, in this particular event, to the reality of things until he's told afterwards. Right? For example, that uh, Musa and Khidr go, and he uh, Khidr breaks the boat, and at the end, again, I don't want to go over the whole story, but at the end, what? He tells him, well, there was a pirate, he was coming, he was taking all the ships, I heard this boat, so then this boat would be out of uh, out of work for that temporary time while the pirate comes and goes. When the, by the time the pirate goes, the boat will be okay, and they can then continue with their boat. This was a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you're thinking materially, you're always thinking, why, why me? Why me? Why me? This is not fair. Why me? Why this happened to me? Why did I have this loss? Why did these things happen to me? And so, the next, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, when Allah mentions uh, uh, Cyrus, uh, Zulqarnain, again, about Zulqarnain, I don't want to go into much details, but Zulqarnain is the ideal. The beginning and the ending of Zulqahf is about believers. The believers who were helpless, they were protected in the cave. But when believers, they have power, when believers, they have power, then what they're able to do with that power. And that is what is described. Again, it's very important that how the believers uses the asbab. Because if you read that part about Zulqarnain, the most repeated verse or the most repeated point is He followed the causes of things. He had control of things. But how he used that control was very, very different from the way that a tyrant who was oppressing the people in the first part of the story would use his power. The first, see when the, those seven people they believed in something different from the king and they were being terrorized and they had to seek refuge in a cave. When Zulqarnain saw people who couldn't they were people, they were weak. What did he do? He let them be. He let the primitive people be. He let people be as they are in their natural state without trying to change them. So, then after that, what does Allah say? The last ten verses of Thulqaf. Now again, it is summarizing the reality of this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> First Allah says, هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا should I tell you of the worst of actions, a'mala? Notice this. And notice the language here is very interesting that Allah uses. Should I tell you of the worst of the actions, the worst of the deeds? Because people, a'mal is generally for good deeds, just so you keep this in mind. A'mal is generally used for, generally. It's for good deeds. So, should I tell you of the worst of the actions that you think are good but are not really good? What is it? Those people who got wasted with their struggle in this life. Now notice the word sunah, sana'ah. Sana'ah means to manufacture. They thought manufacturing, industry, Power, this is the good power, this is the good thing. They had hisab, they had the estimate. That they're making the best sunnah, they're making the best manufacturing. Then, these are the people who just ran after the zina of this world, the beauty and the glitter of this world. These are the people who have denied the ayat of their Rabb. And to meet, meet him. Their actions have gone to waste. They, see why Allah is saying their waste? Is because they think that's good deeds. But it's going to be nothing. There will be no weight to their good deeds on the Day of Judgment. Their reward will be the hellfire. Because of their denial of the truth. 
And because they took my signs, my ayat, my Quran, and my Rasul as a jest, oh, you know, who cares about religion? Who cares about God? When it happens, it happens. It'll happen. If it happens, we'll see. And you know that man in the, the story of the two gardens, what does he say? I don't think my garden will go ever. And even if I go back, then he says, Why in, uh, if I go back to my Rabb, he, he gave me such good things in this life, surely he will give me greater things in the next life. If he treated me so kindly, I'm not like these unfortunate people, so there must be something good about me, and then definitely I'll be even treated better in the next life, even if there is. The, the trap of the time of the Dajjal will be a time where human beings will be godless. It will be a godless society. That's the main theme of the surah. The surah, Sutul Kahf, is the surah that introduces you to the fitna of the Dajjal, not Masih of the Dajjal, the fitna of the Dajjal, the chaos and the corruption in that society. Then from that chaos and corruption of that society, a personality will be thrown up who will lead people even in a worse direction. He will be Masih of the Dajjal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then Allah says, Inna Same thing as how it began, this is how it's ending. Indeed, those people who believed and took the right actions. For them is Jannatul Firdausi Nuzula. They will get Jannatul Firdaus as their, their, you can say, you know, you say, come here for a cup of tea. This is the beginning of what they'll get. This will be their reception. Nuzula, you can say, is reception. Now, over here, ending with these powerful words, you can say, Allah says, If the, if the oceans were made into the ink of the kalimat of Allah. Kalimat has many meanings. Again, you know, I've summarized a whole surah and just... Kalimat can mean... the the word of Allah, a command of Allah. Kalimat can mean the praise of Allah, it has many meanings. But if all these oceans were made into the kalimat of Allah, it wouldn't finish. You rely, you're relying, you are a people. I wish I had remembered that, uh, the poem of Iqbal, where he says that uh, something to the, the, the translation of which is the, the, the Romans, they, they trust in the machines that they have. But the mu'min, he trusts in Allah. And this is the essential difference. So, the point here is, Allah says, Even if the ink, all of the ink of the oceans was, the oceans were made ink and all of that finished. And new water was brought, still the kalimat of Allah would continue. Meaning, you rely on these other things. Then Allah says, Qul inna basharu. Where is the kalimat of Allah? The kalam of Allah is the Qur'an. So that's why Allah ends with, Qul, O Muhammad sallallahu say to them, inna basharu mithlukum. I'm a human being just like you. But what's the difference? That kalimat, I have been given those kalimat. But I have been given wahi from Allah, the kalam of Allah. This is much more powerful than the things that you try to store up, than the things that you try to have, the things that you're running after, this zina, this world that's going to end at the end anyway. We struggle all our lives to escape our singular, our you know, our singularity. I don't want to go into explaining that right now, but inshallah, I'm going to end. Uh, in the second khutbah, أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات. إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. ونشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله. For the people that have now come late, 
when I usually start my khutbah, there's very, I do want to, um, Who's Hamza? The small kid. Your sister's reading outside. Sorry. So, um, as I was saying, that, you know, when I start, there are a few people, and now I'm going to summarize for everyone else. So, the Gahf is the surah that is supposed to help you protect yourself from the jah. When you read this surah, the surah, its main theme, the main theme, the main focus, is that do not be tricked, do not be deceived by this material world. This material world looks like it's permanent, but it's not permanent. This material world is going to trick a lot of people. And Masih al-Dijjal will use the trick of this world to fool a lot of people. And as the Prophet said, he will be a blind man in a world where, you know, people are blind, they're going to follow the one-eyed man. That's what they say. When you're blind yourself, then you'll find, follow the one-eyed the one man. So how do you help yourself see beyond appearances into the reality of things? How do you help yourself see the reality of things? One of the best ways to do that is to dive into this surah, Sutulkah, because I can't tell you how deep this surah is. It goes so deep down, it's not even... I mean, just as one or two examples, because now time is running out. This surah mentions the seven sleepers, remember? If you've ever read... Today, go. Brothers and sisters, go today. Read the Kahab today with what I've told you now, in this, this in mind. The companions of the Prophet were successful because they weren't addicted to material thoughts, in the sense that they were free. Because in Islam, freedom is not that you can do anything you want. Freedom is that you're free from the chains that hold you back. Chains that handicap you. <laughs> chains that they have, fetters that they have, chains that we put on ourselves, that I have to have this, and I have to have this, and I have to do this, and all these demands we have put on ourselves. These are the things that chain us and take away our freedom. Freedom isn't that you do whatever you want. Free, you're not free. If you're stuck in desires, if you're addicted to desires, if you're, if you're stuck in your world of, of materialism, you're stuck. If you're stuck in the world where there are people higher than you and lower than you because of material means, you're, you're stuck. You're not free. You're very unfree. And so the main theme of the surah is to look at those seven, do you think, you know, we think we live in a world where miracles don't happen. This is the essential problem. We think everything will happen because of cause and effect. And Allah says, no. Look at your own lives. How many things have happened at the right place at the right time to put you where you are? You think it was your struggle, it wasn't just only your struggle. If you read the life of the Prophet, one of the interesting things one, some, somebody told me is, I was just talking to one scholar and I said, what's the most interesting thing you find about the life of the Prophet? He said that people don't talk about this, but it's about how Allah helped the Prophet along, even though he struggled, but in that struggle, how Allah was there all the time helping him to be at the right place at the right time, to meet the right people at the right time, and to build his strength where he was finally able to take over Makkah from being alone. Anyway, let's do dua. I do want to mention that one of my um, teachers uh, who had taught me, I used to um, study with him every day. He had started, if those people know, in Chicago there was a, Dr. Amir Ali had started a, kind of like a reading center where any non-Muslim can come and read about. It was just a reading center in downtown Chicago. And one of his friends, his name is Muhammad Firdosi, who was a chaplain in the prisons, and every day after high school, I would go and help with the questions people from the prisons would have. They'd send questions, and I'd answer them, and then he'd read them, and then tell me, you know, and there's a lot of interesting stories, but he passed away, so please do to offer him. He was one of my teachers, and uh, uh, may Allah forgive him. 
but he converted a lot of people to Islam. And you know, the one place in, in America where people are still converting every day is the prison system. And what's the hikmah of Allah uh, in that? I don't know, but it is, it is happening. It is a reality. Anyway, uh, we'll have also other du'as uh, after, the, uh, after the prayers, inshallah. إن الله يعمل من أدل والإحسان وإيداء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد فأقيم الصلاة